So my talk um, focuses on the felt sense, and I will also keep very much to my manuscript because I just know it helps me keep the time. Um, I want to offer you seven different approaches to the felt sense. Seven. Yes. And it, you will see it's not. It is approaches which uh, are kind of in continuity, but really this is a work in process. So to know how to do focusing implies to know, to get to know the felt sense. And there is this big challenge when you begin to learn to focus. How and where do I find the felt sense? How do I know that it is the felt sense? Am I able to have a felt sense? Maybe it is not to be found in me. Maybe there is nothing there. We all know from our own experience and from our experience in teaching, focusing, but these are the questions which which are there at the beginning. Also, the notion of the felt sense has a certain aura, aura around it. If you go to the focusing website or you look at focusing books, you find big words related to it, like inner wisdom, or wisdom of the body, or the body knows the truth. Or the website of the institute speaks of deep wisdom at all times, even for the rest of your life. It speaks of having within yourself the answers to life's dilemmas and frustrations. So of course, to begin to learn focusing goes together with a lot of respect in relation to this term, and also with a lot of anxious hope of encountering it somewhere within oneself. It might be disquieting for focusing beginners if they knew that when advanced focuses are together, the ones who are supposed to know, a major question of ongoing debates is what is a felt sense, at least in the German-speaking communities which I'm part of. As far as I'm concerned, the more you get to know focusing, the more the certainty evaporates around this beautiful notion. And maybe it's good for focusing beginners not to know that too well. When you go and see how Jen Lin speaks about the felt sense, for instance, in little films available on YouTube, he famously makes a face and makes strange sounds. <laughs> you know it. He advises to go down into the body, not too deep, and once it becomes murky and unclear, very unpromising, that's what he says, not interesting, not high standing, not sophisticated, there you are. So it is the region between the interesting zone of emotions, intentions, plans, stories and ideas, and the wonderful clearness more below of the meditative space. Somewhere in between is the murky and messy place where you begin to do focusing. This messiness, which Jenlin indicates with his face, is where you encounter the felt sense. Maybe we should say the messiness is the felt sense. So the felt sense is the mess we find inside, far from being the treasure box which one finds in the center of one's body, far from wisdom, far from all the answers to your life's dilemmas. But still, at least, it seems to be something, not nothing. The word seems to indicate that it, there is something there, a felt sense, or maybe we should say a felt mess. <laughs> I want to now open up several perspectives and follow several traces but go far beyond the implication that the felt sense is a something inside, whether a piece of wisdom or a piece of mess, or a mysterious feeling, or a hidden information, or implicit answers. <coughs> First of all, in his article, Discovery of Felt Meaning, Jensen warns the reader that the felt sense may seem as if it were only one unit, the meaning of a given set of words, the sense of this question or this situation. Because when explicated in words, it turns to be many, many things. This is the first respect in which it can be misleading to speak of the felt sense as if it were an inner entity. Jenin explicitly wants the thing that he calls felt sense to not be understood like that. The felt sense thing is many things. Like in the TAE steps, if we are invited to ask ourselves, what do you want this term to mean? We could say as a first step, we want the felt sense thing to mean many things. This is a paradox. And isn't that nice? And 
how could it be different? How could a main word of gene gentleman not contain a thick paradox? And I think that paradox can be our heuristic principle to unpack the intricate meaning of this term. With heuristic, I mean a mental shortcut to ease the cognitive load. You can read that in Wikipedia. So let us use the paradox as a mental shortcut to lay out directly the challenge which we face when spelling out the meaning of a felt sense, also to people who don't know. Our first paradox is the thing which is called a felt sense is many things. This reminds us of Jean's definition of relevance in experiencing and the creation of meaning. He speaks of relevance as a meaning containing many meanings. Felt sense and relevance in this regard seem deeply related notions. Let me for now summarize what we have. We have a thing, a felt sense thing, meaning many things. This implies a picture. Again, if we study Jenlin, we will find him disturb this kind of image structuring our understanding of the felt sense. He continues, even in the same quote, really, we should call it a flow of felt sensing, not individual bits. Felt sense is an activity. So we must immediately drop this static image with the boxes. Now it becomes more difficult to render this meaning graphically, a kind of flow unfolding in one meaning after the other. <coughs> but how come this messy thing that is not a thing but a flow, not a felt thing but a felt sensing, has meaning at all? Does this meaning come with the flow? With this kind of question, we can't help but enter philosophy a little bit. Felt sense, we could say, is a direct referent. This is Jenlin's first functional relationship in experiencing and the creation of meaning. So what does Jenlin mean with reference? <coughs> he says, I quote, by reference we mean something very modest, and we do not wish to involve ourselves in the philosophical discussions implied by this term. So we are lucky. <coughs> we don't need to really go deeply into philosophy yet. He says, we mean only that attention is given to the feeling as such. So we seem to be back to square one. But let's ask, what does it mean to give attention to a feeling? <coughs> does this mean that we turn on some kind of inner light and thus then discover the felt sense inside? Maybe we can simply say, giving attention to a feeling is a way of feeling a feeling. We all know that we can think, speak, or do something, and also, on the side, so to say, feel something, without noticing it much. In that case, we continue thinking, speaking, or doing what we do despite of the ongoing feeling. Direct reference is stopping all this and feeling the feeling. That is why this is so direct. What we refer to is not something else separable from us, like noticing a thing outside, like an apple. Neither is it noticing a thing inside, or a flow of meanings. It is direct because the activity of feeling is the reference. In feeling the feeling, reference and referent fall together. We have to feel. I admit that we are moving a little bit more into philosophy. Let's hear what Jen has to say more about the direct reference. In direct reference, symbols such as this feeling refer without conceptualizing or representing the felt meaning to which they refer. Thus, the role of symbols in direct reference is distinguishable from other roles symbols can have because in direct reference, there need not be a conceptualization at all. So, language has a quite humble role in direct reference. It only points. There is something, I don't know what it is. This is hard to say. This is strange. I have no words for this. This is difficult. This is kind of something exciting, maybe. But the word this does have an important function. We can come back to it by speaking of this, by making it to something, to an it, 
of this. By speaking about this from which we don't know yet what it is, we make a something of it. Direct reference is a first example of gender's functional relationships, of symbols and experiencing working together to create meaning. In this case, the force and the weight of the meaningfulness is not yet in words. Yet words can somehow function to stabilize it by making it an it. Now without noticing, or maybe you have, we are in the middle of philosophy. And I would even say in a kind of ethics, a very subtle kind of ethics. Because a felt sense seems to be a very close working together of language and experiencing. It is a way of relating to an experience, a feeling, and a way of speaking about it without covering it up by the meaning of a concept. This happens when we determine the feeling without direct reference, when we say what we believe it should be. So let me try to say this in different ways, because this is important for me, also for my work. It is a way of speaking, indirect reference or felt sensing, in which concepts serve in order for meaning to happen, which is not yet in language. It is a way of speaking in which meaning deliberately emerges, needing concepts and experiencing working together. It is a way of using symbols that interact with the feeling to gradually unfold meaning in language. Now we are a step closer to notice how intriguing this is if we speak of a felt sense, because it seems to be a concept and a practice at the same time. Because also in my sentence on words interacting with a feeling, the meaning of all the words I use in my sentence are results of words and felt meaning working together. But also, let's notice, if I say words interact with the feeling, Immediately we have images in our heads. We think there's a feeling, there are words, they kind of work together. And it is amazing how quickly our descriptions create some kind of images, concepts, ideas that seem to suggest how things are. Feelings, words, again, things like entities working together. It is amazing how quickly we substitute what we, ex what we experience, what we experience in what we say about it. And I, this is, again, a point of direct reference, going back to the reference, and it is something which Wittgenstein noticed a lot and criticized a lot. And I think um, it is exactly there where gender philosophy becomes very exciting. So direct reference is a different kind of practice and a different kind of way of understanding what we do when we make meaning, or when we speak of feelings. In microphenomenology, which is an amazing new discipline developed in France, this is one of the major insights. While we have exciting ideas, while we have feelings, while we perceive something, while we use words that mean something, we have little clue how we perceive, how we make meaning, how we think, how we feel. We believe we know. We have very, very crude concepts for what actually happens, and they get into the way of really trying to find words for this happening. And I think this is where Jensen's big paradigm shifting effort lies, that he went a long way in coping with this challenge. The more he tried to describe and to grasp it, the more distinct entities, such as feelings and words and acts of reference, dissolved entirely into highly complex processes, multi-layered interactions in which vast pasts are functioning, realizing that meaningful words are the result of breathtakingly exciting processes in the macro perspective of a development that has an evolutionary dimension, but also in the micro perspective of creating meaning every day. The outcome to tackle the challenge of understanding how it is possible that in a slight feeling there is so much that it is difficult to put it in words, not because it is suppressed content, but because it is so intricate 
but in a slight change even in relating to it, there is so much change. We know it took him decades of working on a process model in solitude and great concentration while doing all the other things he did to face these questions. Finally, on about I think, 256 pages, that was the original manuscript, he unraveled an intricate embodied responsive context that turns around all our Western dualistic programs. This is implicit in what gender means with a felt sense. So let me give you a bit of philosophical <coughs> context. It was William James who noticed, I think for the first time in the as far as I know in the history of philosophy, a tacit feeling from which we speak. He noticed that there's a slight feeling before we start to speak. And this is his wonderful quote. Has the reader never asked himself what kind of mental fact is his intention of saying a thing before he has said it? It is an entirely definite intention, distinct from all other intentions, an absolute distinct state of consciousness, therefore, and yet how much of it consists of definite sensorial images, either of words or of things? Hardly anything. Linger, and the words and things come into mind. The anticipatory intention is there no more. It has therefore a nature of its own, of the most positive sort, and yet, what can we say about it without using words that belong to the later mental facts of replacing it? The emphasis on the words coming, if you linger with this anticipatory feeling, is familiar to us. It's the same coming that Jenlin ponders on and on in many articles. The fact that words come in this way, as a felt sense comes. Words come in situations mostly without us having to think about what we have to say. Still, this seems not special. After all, where or when else should words come than in situations? Difficult to imagine that noticing this all to obvious phenomenon radically shifted powerful background assumptions of what it means to mean something. Philosophers early on and cognitive scientists today still envision concepts and intentions as something inside the human mind that perceives an outside world, which is then represented somehow inside. It's a very, very powerful image, which is not just powerful in science, but also in an everyday way of conception. This inside-outside structure, body-mind split, feeling rationality split. It was extremely revolutionary of the classical pragmatist and the later Wittgenstein, to notice that being in a situation is of utmost importance for making sense, and that this shifts these <laughs> assumptions. Listen to what John Dewey remarked when, he, in the first decades of the last century, he was inquiring into scientific inquiry. He says, it is more or less a commonplace that it is possible to carry on observations that amass facts tirelessly, and yet the observed facts leave nowhere. We can, mm -hmm. we can if we do science, we can collect and collect and collect information, and it doesn't really lead anywhere. On the other hand, it is possible to have the work of observation so controlled by conceptual framework, fixed in advance, <laughs> that the very things which are genuinely decisive in the problem at hand and its solution are completely overlooked. That's the other danger. We're so fixed with what we want to find that we cannot even see. Everything is forced into the predetermined conceptual and theoretical scheme. The way and the only way to escape these two evils, John Dewey says, is sensitivity to the quality of a situation as a whole. In ordinary language, a problem must be felt before it can be stated. Yes, and there was another person you know that highly influenced um, gentleman, he wrote his master. And Dintai also was this master in thinking of the all too obvious. And what he noticed was that we don't have to put together our life according, you know, with categories or notions to realize that it's an identity. Philosophers, philosophers only had these 
the concepts that are concepts which put together the order of our world and of our understanding. And it was just that you noticed, hmm, but somehow on a very, very basic level, it doesn't apply. We don't every day in the evening we have to put our day together with concepts. We have a living continuity just by living. And this living continuity is so much more complex than logic. And it, it creates different kind of concepts. And he already noticed that concepts and experiencing can work together. That concepts that apply to experiencing a certain way deepen their meaning, but they also deepen the experiencing. So, so taking these kinds of cues very seriously, which of course were greatly enhanced through Jenlin's collaboration with Rogers, thinking from these tacit, subtle phenomena of ordinary experience became an extremely fru fruitful starting point in Eugene Jenlin's philosophical work on a level of theory and on a level of practice. How come that words come in situations? That's such a basic question, so we wouldn't even come to the question. That, I think, was one of the burning questions of Jenlin's work. How come that situational feelings are relevant and even regulate what we think? How is it that experience brings along patterns and structures that are more intricate and innovative than the conceptual orders we know? Aren't human beings made up of bodies and minds? And the reason is a specific human characteristic in the mind where the concepts are, the ideas are, traditionally conceived as separate from the body. Aren't feeling something inside and subjective? And that's still such a strong image, feelings to be inside and subjective. Aren't we kind of separated from everything which is around us? Of course, we perceive objects. But how should we be able to feel situations? That's how are we able to feel a bigger system? So why do words come in this strange, almost unconscious way without us even having to think? All these tacit phenomena, the lived connectivity, the felt situation, the bodily coming of words disturbed foundational beliefs of powerful cuts between body and mind. The role of a situation disturbed powerful cuts of subject and object. Jensen will emphasize again and again it is important to realize that for us today also words come form in a bodily way. The right words must come to us. If they don't, there's little we can do about it except wait in a bodily way, sense what our situation is and what we sense that, that, that we were about to say. It is our bodily being in the situation we are in that lets the right words come. How do they come? We don't sift through many wrong words as if going through a file. We don't select words from among many, many other words. The right words, or close to the right words, just come. What precedes this coming? Sometimes a bodily sense of a situation. But often, there is no separately attended to sense, there is no separate attended to yeah, there's something says, to sense of this kind. Being in the situation lets the words come. The gentleman emphasis carried on the astonishing remarks of the classic pragmatist and the hermeneutics, and of course the phenomenologists and the existentialists, which I did not mention here, which did not fit into a powerful and long philosophical tradition. Gentleman once told me, sitting in his chair in Spring Valley, that these classical pragmatists were the air he was breathing as a young philosopher. And myself being raised in a very conventional European style of philosophy, I must say that Jenlin later became the air I was breathing after my PhD, and I was convinced I could not go on with this, having a philosophy which also works in that way, that you become more and more kind of split creature, kind of very, very trained in your mind, but there's nobody anymore <coughs> intellectual. Yeah. So, gentlemen, I remember how the following quote struck me again and again when I first came across it, and I quoted it so often. The coming of words is so clever. They come specifically and newly phrased to make just your point. 
The words come with their past uses taken into account. Much that you have read and know is taken account of, as well as the present situation. What you just heard these people say, what you know of them from other times, even the peculiar way in which this group uses certain words. Again, why are words and situations inherently together in the bodily focaling that implies the right words? So this is one of the basic challenges Janet's thinking pursues in his life work. And I think one could say it's one of the challenges which is behind his elaboration of the process model. And this brings me to a next approach to the felt sense. A felt sense is situational intricacy. If you work yourself through Janet's process model, a very beautiful result is that you get a new understanding of situations, a rather awe-inspiring understanding. You understand each moment as a crossing from a vast past and present living. In a situation, in the understanding of a situation, then I would like us to kind of understand situations as forms of understanding. Situations are not objects around us, people around They are forms of understanding. So diffuse as it might be, or so unspectacular, a vast past experiencing is implicit. Our education, our professional experience, our relations, our childhoods, what just happened a moment ago, in the morning, yesterday, things which happened long ago might still be here with us very present. What we might just have read in a newspaper you know, Jenlin, is Jenlin's paragraphs of making us aware, all those implicit things, a dream which is still with us. These are Jenlin's wonderful lists. And all this not as separated, but as Jenlin puts it, as a pre-separated multiplicity, a subtle, complex understanding of now. Heidegger used to speak of Befindlichkeit, pointing to this phenomenon. Damasio today calls this a feeling for what happens. The philosopher Matthew Radcliffe speaks of existential feelings. Jenlin's philosophical work goes further by making us aware that a present moment or a present situation is a grown environment. And I think that's a quite intriguing way of thinking about it. Grown out of earlier events, events and experiences, an environment in which we move like a spider on her web. One could say, each of your nows is your web, intricately woven by your life experiences. This situational web of the presence is continuously growing and changing. It is constitutive of who we are, how we live, how we understand ourselves and others. So you must can think that each of yours now is now is an intricate woven net in which a vast past is functioning. And when we interact, these highly complex environmental nows start to interact with each other. I have an um, image which is quite a wild metaphor for this. This awe-inspiring perspective makes us understand that each single moment of lived experience has not only grown from our personal pasts, our own stories, but of course of much more of structural and situational environments created by the life of our parents and their parents, of generations of living, our cultural history, the history of our species, our evolutionary history, continuing in our own life thread, in the intricate patterns of daily situations. Because the living process creates structures in which it goes on in, which is this wonderful concept of Jenlin's environment two, environment three, <coughs> it is a homegrown environment, a homegrown meaningful environment in which we move in. And if one allows oneself to think this, then it just doesn't become any mysterious at all. <coughs> the capacities of our feeling, it becomes mystery, mysterious, how, how totally reductive our ways of conceiving it were or are still with cuts between subject and object and feeling. It's just, it just seems that the rational way of understanding this 
seems to be so, so full of prejudice <laughs> uh, towards the actual experiencing. But I think it's not prejudice, it's just the challenge of finding a language and thinking from there. And that's you know, really um, what this kind of thinking from where Jenin comes and which he carried forward, that's really this, that's really this um, paradigm shift from another way of saying the paradigm shift. What he, what he allowed our thinking to do, to really find the words for that and find the concepts for that. So into this grown fabric of our daily situations, the present moment, as Jenlin says so beautifully, occurs into. This is quite a meeting, from moment to moment. Everything which happens, everything we do and say occurs into how we understand ourselves and others, our daily life, our past and future, and what we can do or say next. So this makes human situations so open at times. But this also is why we sometimes must keep it closed. Multifaceted and rich, multi-interpretational and sensitive with each new crossing of present and past, or with each new event, our self-understanding and our world may be newly at stake. We ourselves and who we can be may be newly at stake. Because each occurring can affect the situational, embodied, and planned. So Jenin says, these many past experiences are now functioning within one new experience. This is not the past as it was then, but as it is here now, relevant now, involved and being lived, participating in the experiencing that your body implies and enacts now. What each experience is, is already <coughs> being affected by the others, which are already affected by it. This is a typical, this is the way we learn to think uh, when we start thinking with gender. And he also says, when the past functions to interpret the present, the past is changed by so functioning. <coughs> the past functions not as itself, but as already changed by what it is functioning in. And maybe you know, this is one favorite quote, which I very often quote, how are you when you affect me is already affected by me, and not by me as I usually am, but by me as I occur with you. And I would like to paraphrase it for the creation of meaning in situations. We could say, what a word means is already affected by the lived situation, by the lived situation already affected by the use of the word. So our bodies do not live in situations. They are, I would like to say, a grown embodied context, <coughs> a living continuation of complex situational entanglement, entanglements, carrying forward vast pasts. So body, in, body environment interaction, feeling, behavior, situations, language, meaning, and human bodies evolved together. This is what Jen, this is the training of thinking, which, which is the process model. They cannot be understood and grasped separately. Each factors imply each other's. So this kind of process and this kind of mutual implying, Jen then begins to think in great, great detail, as intricate as it was possible for him, because the difficulty is that most of it is implicit is implying. Yeah. So giving this situational feeling attention means felt sensing. It is a many making one that generates its relevance. The intricacy is an implying of something very specific, as Denden always um, emphasizes, in order to be carried forward and not just interrupted, or in some small or big sense stopped. Something very specific may carry the implying forward. If that happens, if what we do or say carries this intricacy forward, we know what was implied. I remember that this was one of the crux moments in my understanding of this philosophy, and it really kind of concretized in, in Jenlin's living room. He was sitting in his old chair when I worked myself into understanding his philosophy and realized that it is really a different way of thinking. I constantly repeated this question. 
If occurred what was implied, then we know what was implicit before. Which I then patiently said, no. <laughs> Only after carrying forward what was implied, do you know what was implied. I said, okay. But then you also know what was implied before it was carried forward. Again, he said, patiently and a little bit worried about me, said, no. <laughs> you only know what was implied after it was carried forward. I thought I was sitting in front of a Zen master who gave me a koan. <laughs> Again, I tried. Well, after it has been carried forward, one knows what was implied all along. Again, calm, very serious, no. <laughs> Not all along, only after it was carried forward. You can imagine how difficult it was for me, but I began to understand, and this understanding kept unfolding tacit assumptions I had about a reality that was independent of what we said, analyzed, and described, a reality in what happened next was kind of independent of what happened before, a, 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 a future or a present independent of a past, yes, and a cause independent of an effect. So the kind of precise carrying forward is an amazing experience. Gentlin realized that this can be cultivatable, thus allowing us to attend to situations in a new way, opening intricacy at any moment we want. This is called focusing, making life a fantastically differentiated affair, which we can work with on a micro level that can have macro effects. Being able to meet the needs of a situation is the present functioning into a past, functioning into the present, thus changing what was implied. This is a great change. Now coming back with all this working for us in the background to the question, what is a felt sense? I would like to try a new answer. Felt sensing is practice, creating its space and objects. <coughs> Maybe today we could assume, and we also discuss that sometimes, um, focusers in, in German speaking, if a felt sense is like a somatic marker. Damasio has shown that these complex gut feelings hold a lot of learning experiences, a lot of situations, a lot of information. And they help us to decide very quickly. They know much more without them we couldn't think. I would like to decline this interpretation. A felt sense, if you like, is a way of relating to a somatic marker. A felt sense is neither an emotion nor a complex kind of feeling like a somatic marker, but a certain way and manner of feeling. One could say a felt sense is a way of relating to a somatic marker, which thus opens up and changes into many strands situational facets. When we feel a somatic marker, in a felt sensing way, it changes. It does not decide for us. <coughs> when we feel a felt sense, we don't just feel something, we practice. I think this is one of the most important messages I I'm, I'm want to give myself <laughs> in working through this topic. Jenlin's careful explanations in, pro in a process belt model make it clear how generative and creative, in a literal sense, <coughs> felt sensing is as a micro practice. In a process model, especially in chapter 8, Jenlin elaborates how felt sensing is a practice that co generates its objects, co generates its space, co generates something more whole. Jenlin describes this like that. If you tell an ordinary person to stand next to some feeling or emotion, the phrase will not make sense in that use. Where do you mean stand next to? The person will say, the new space is not familiar, has not been constituted by this person. People feel things in their chest and stomach that is one way, and also in their situations that is another way. In felt sensing, a new space opens where you can do new things. It needs the practice of this space to grow and allow new, you could say, intra-situational moves, as well as new objects, so to say. Whereas usually we respond to some aspect of a situation, some feeling, some implication, something said, something happening, 
Self-sensing is a practice toward more and more of a situation. This is blurry, as we know, not again because of suppressed context, but because it is so thick. Jenin says in chapter 8 in the process mode, since cultural situations are very complex, and each situation implicitly involves others too, which are also complex, a very great deal more is bodily lived and felt than is ever sequenced as such in those sequences we consider our feelings. Felt sensing is thus a certain kind of sequence that relates to situations in a certain way. Jendlin exemplifies this with the dancer Isadora Duncan, standing still sometimes for hours in order to find a new move. As passive as this standing might seem, it is highly creative. Isadora is pursuing something which needs her full attention, which is not yet available, but because that it becomes available by this special subtle kind of pursuing. Jendlin says, her new looking, waiting for netting, these change what comes, but it is still not right. She responds to its changed way of feeling by being differently toward it in some way. She points to a facet of that feel of what she would dance, pursues it. In response to the pointing and the pursuing, the feeling itself becomes more distinct, like something there, a datum, an object, something in a space that wasn't there before. This new kind of feel isn't there waiting. It forms in this new sequence. And then Jenlin says, continues to say, where does this new sequence happen? In a new space generated by this new kind of sequence. So what seems very noteworthy for us after the journey we have gone is to begin to understand that the felt sense is not a concept of an object, a referent, a datum, or a space but for a practice that creates new objects and new spaces. These are generated not just by acting on what we feel, not just by following day-to-day -day routines, not by following established situational patterns of doing things, but by attending to the more that is implied in all this and articulating this. The felt sense is a result of a subtle interactional sequence which affirms Jenlin's principle of interaction first. This feel and this new space are both made in this very interaction. This is an instance of our principle interaction first. Only from the interaction do we know do the participants come. A new kind of interaction makes new participants. And therefore it is sometimes difficult to speak to people who do not relate to the experience in a certain way of the felt sense. And if we talk about it as if it were an object independent of a practice, this of course can be misleading. So in this way, focusing is radically creative. It recreates the body, and with body we mean body-environment interaction that on the human level is a highly intricate embodied situational context involving language. It creates new spaces, new possibilities, new things that matters. But this is not arbitrary, it's not just a creation. Felt sensing, and this is now the next step, and my final dimension, is a practice to access and create more wholeness in our way of responding to situations thus regenerating a situation in the way what matches, what matters in it. Then it says, yeah, um, it, it, can, it can be a slight change, but actually it is an enormous change because so much, so much is working together. Um, yeah. um, Sorry. So I come to my very last um, definition. But I first want to kind of show you the way we went. A felt sense thing is many things. A felt sense is a flow of meaning. 
I felt sense is a direct referent. I felt sense is situational intricacy. A felt sense is a practice creating its own space and objects. And as a last one, thank you. It's seven. It should be six, but I like the seven so much that it's <laughs> I want to say felt sensing is dancing with the situation. Um, Jenlin has this very important quote that he says, um, Normally we are in a situation, but in the focusing space, we are in a space in which the whole situation starts to move. The situation becomes a highly complex new, and that's the word object is not so nice, but it's just like a new object of attention. This dance allows us to engage as much of our situation as possible, which is rather limited vast past, vast environments, and as Jenlin often mentions, the whole universe literally participates. If we learn to relate literally wholesome enough, the living of our entire planet is implicitly inclusive. Thus felt sensing is a never-ending practice, an exercise of being human in a way that becomes more and more inclusive, and at the same time also very specific, just this as Janet emphasized again and again, attending to the specific more which is there now, as we sense it being embodied, being ourselves embodied situational context. And at the same time, this is very innovative, creating fantastic differentiatedness and meaning that grows with every new carrying forward. So in this way, and here I want to end, felt sense is a practice that becomes more and more important today, complementing every kind of reductionism and simplification, which is also sometimes very necessary and very helpful. But we need to know to do the other thing. Yet only by being able to complement reductionism and simplification can we counter steer a scientific and cultural development imprinting our lives in ways that seem to imply that we can drop out the human in order to enhance ourselves and our intelligence. So with this, I would like to stop and thank you. Thank you.